Worship is about giving it all up to the praise of our God. I want to talk this morning about the most dangerous place for the Christian. The most dangerous place for the Christian. Matthew's gospel says, then the devil left him and angels came and ministered to him. Luke's gospel chapter 4 says, then the devil left him for a season. In Matthew's gospel, ministering angels came to his aid. For the devil would leave him for a season. Have you noticed that after a lofty experience, after an exciting time of worship, after a huge and great blessing in your life, the devil comes to snatch your joy. To sap your enthusiasm. To pull the rug out from under you spiritually. Because with great victories come great trials. In the text, Jesus leaves the heights of experience at the Jordan River where the heavens open and the spirit in the form of a dove descends and lights on Jesus and announces to the world in God's voice, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That's a lofty experience. But between the lofty heights of the Jordan, there is the depths of the desert. At the Jordan, his ministry is affirmed. In the desert, his ministry is attacked. And I need to warn you, the moment God affirms you, in the self-same hour, the devil will attack you. I wish I had a witness right here. Now, now, brothers and sisters, for the believer, the wilderness, the desert experience is not an escape from reality. But it is rather an engagement with the eternal. But when you read the Bible, every challenge met in the desert or in the wilderness, God gave victory. Uh, Abraham took his only son Isaac in the wilderness to sacrifice him. And when God saw Abraham's faithfulness, he rewarded him by saying there's a ram caught in the thicket and it was on that spot that Abraham called God by a new name. Jehovah Jireh, uh, the God who will provide. Moses, on the backside of the Midian desert, saw a bush on fire, but it was not being consumed. It was burning with no smoke. And when Moses drew near, God says, take your shoes off 
For the ground you stand on is holy ground. I've heard the cries of my people by reason of their taskmasters, and I'm now going to use you to deliver the children of Israel. David had to hide in the wilderness from the insanity of King Saul. And it was there that David writes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I wish they had a Bible reader here. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, it was there that they stumbled and they fell. Every wilderness trial brings God's victory. Um, this, this story, this, this, this testing of Jesus can be related to the struggle of Adam in the garden. Jesus, who is the second Adam, comes to take back from Satan what he stole from Adam in the Garden of Eden. Uh, God put Adam and Eve in the garden to conserve and conceive. And uh, when Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he forfeited the keys to the earth. He relinquished his authority to Satan, who is now prince of the air and ruler of this world because Adam freely gave it to him. But the second Adam, Jesus Christ, came to take back from the devil what he stole from Adam in the garden. I want you to see this. A point that is often overlooked in this temptation is the nature of Satan's attack. Satan's temptations toward Jesus in the wilderness were all concentrated on luring Jesus to fight on the divine level uh, rather than on the human level. Because only a human could rob Satan of his power because it was a human who gave it up in the first place. When you read the text, Satan never calls Jesus son of man. He says, if you are, and that word in the, in the, in the, in the, in the English, if you are, it's an inaccurate translation because Satan knows who Jesus is. This is not his first encounter with Jesus. That ought to accurately be translated since you are the son of God. He never calls Jesus son of man because he wants to rob him of his humanity. Because only a man can save us. Not just any man, but a man nevertheless. Because it was a man who got us in trouble in the first place. Let me see if I can make this make sense. Um, man sinned in a garden. Jesus redeemed in a garden. Man sinned with a woman. God redeemed with a woman. Man sinned on a tree. God redeemed on a tree. Everything Satan stole from us in Genesis, Jesus took back in Matthew. He is our kinsman redeemer. Well, I wish I had a Bible reader right here. He takes back from the devil. He snatches back from the devil 
our humanity. Uh, walk with me around the text. Uh, the Bible says that there are three great enemies of the Christian. And the three great enemies of the Christian are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And each one of these temptations answers the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus comes as the true humanity to demonstrate we can live victoriously over the devil's tests. He tests him in the flesh and he wins. He tests him with the eyes and he wins. He tests him with pride and he wins. And if we can ever overcome the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life, we would have victory in our Christian experience. But here's how Jesus shows us how to do it. The first temptation, Satan comes to Jesus who's been in the wilderness 40 days. This test also takes us back to Israel who was in the wilderness 40 years. Somebody ought to help me preach it. And Jesus, who is 100% man, because you do know he divests himself of his divine attributes to only have power when it is given to him by his father. But as a man, he is subject to everything like as we are, yet without sin. I need two or three more Bible readers here. And as a man, he is hungry. He is physically hungry. And the devil will always come to you in your moment of vulnerability. He will always try to test you with what you're in need of to get it without God. It's right here in the text. He says, since you are son of God, I know you're hungry. I know you've been here 40 days. You haven't eaten anything. Your body is getting emaciated. Your flesh is starting to feed on itself. You're God. You, 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 you can do this. This is nothing for you to do. Since you are God, since you are son of God, just command by your power that these stones become bread. Uh, you can do it. Since you're God, demonstrate that you're God by making these stones bread. He's hungry. He's weakened. He's human. And Satan does not want Jesus to fight as God. He wants to attack him as a man. So he says, since you are God, make these stones bread. Satan wanted Jesus to dedicate his ministry to changing the world, but not saving it. Because you can undergo change and never get saved. Nature forms us. Sin deforms us. Environments conform us. Schools inform us. Prisons reform us. But only Christ Jesus can transform us. Jesus did not come to change the world. He came to save the world. Uh, Jesus could use his divinity 
and turn these stones to bread, that would save people from hunger. Or he could use his humanity and appeal to God and save people from their sin. Let me run that by you one more time. He could use his divinity and turn stones into bread and save people from hunger. Or he could use his humanity, appeal to God, and save people from their sin. Because the greatest hunger of the human soul is not physical bread. The greatest hunger, the greatest thirst of the human soul is for a relationship with its creator. Satan says, if you're God, prove it. Make these stones bread. Jesus said, it is written. Man, that's, that's, that's who I am. Man, Jesus, flesh, bones, blood, sinew, tissue, heart. Lungs, man, that's who I am. You trying to get me out of being who I am. I am a man and man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let me see if I can help somebody. Have you ever had something wrong in your life and you just can't put your finger on it? You, you knew something was off center. You knew something was messed up. You, you had food in the refrigerator. You had furniture in the house. You had gas in your car. You had money in your account, but there was just something you just couldn't quite put your finger on until you got in a close relationship with God. And it was just you and God. There's some things that food can't satisfy. There are some things money can't buy. Have I got a witness here? Because when I need peace, money can't buy that. When I need my life to be straightened out, no amount of food will satisfy that. When I need structure and order in my life, I need something that the world can't provide. Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word, I, I want you to stay right there with me. Every word, every word, I want you to stay right there with me. Every word, that's power in every word. Thy word. Have I hid in my heart? Yeah, I wish I had a Bible reading. That I might not sin against you. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto every word, every word, every word. You, you, you have no business shouting and getting excited in the worship if you don't know the word. Because the word will settle your life down. Have I got a witness? The word will strengthen you in your dark hours. The word will help you when your world turns upside down. The word will keep you when everything around you is falling apart. Because Isaiah says, I will keep him. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. In perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on me. Has the word ever stopped you from crying? Has the word ever lifted your bow down head? Has the word ever cheered you when you were lonely? There's power in every word. Uh, 
The second temptation. Uh, Satan. That word Satan uh, means adversary. And anybody who tries to stop you and avert you from your mission is being used by Satan. Uh, he is the adversary of the brethren. The devil. Uh, that word diabolos from which we get the English word diabolical. He's a schemer. He's an accuser of the brethren. He's a liar from the beginning. And if you don't watch the devil, he will urge you to believe a gospel that is reasonable but not powerful. A gospel that's exciting but not authoritative. A gospel that flatters but does not confront. A gospel that does not turn people upside down so it can't turn them right side up. Because there's something in us that the gospel is trying to get out. And in order for the gospel to get it out of us, it's got to ransack our lives. Listen, we have a treasure in an earth investment. But that treasure can't come out unless the gospel tears something up. Uh, let me see if I can make this mix in. When, when thieves break in your house, they're looking for your valuables. And if you just left it on the dresser or left it on the kitchen counter, they wouldn't tear your stuff up. they just take your valuables and leave. Help me preach a minute. There's something valuable in us that the gospel has to tear up because we hide it. We hide it under makeup. We hide it under masks. We hide it under disguises. Just like Adam and Eve, we hide it under fig leaves of education. Fig leaves of degrees. Fig leaves of cars and clothes and cash and bank accounts. Those things hide what's hidden in us so the gospel got to tie it up. It, it takes some of us a long time to come to faith because we've been so good at hiding it and masking it and disguising it that it takes some of us years to come to know Jesus Christ. Some of us are just easy to come to faith, but, but some of us have been so hardened by sin that we've started to enjoy our lifestyle. Uh, th th there's a line in the movie Shawshank Redemption, uh, my favorite movie in the world. There's a line in that movie where, where Morgan Freeman says, these walls are funny. First, you hate them. Then, secondly, you get used to them. And then after a while, you become to depend on them. And that's the way sin is. First, you hate it. Then you get used to it. And then you come to depend on it. You become codependent on that drama, on that dance you do to try to get away from what's really bothering you. You don't need a treatment center. You need salvation. You don't need a psychiatrist. You need to be born again. You don't need the 12-step program. There's only one step to come to Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Somebody here who struggled with sin and the Lord ransacked your life, you can help me testify. He'll tie you up, but then he'll put you back together. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? He will tie you up, and then he will mend your broken life. 
Watch this, watch this. Watch, watch this second temptation. Since you are the son of God, throw yourself down from the pinnacle in this temple. For he will give his angels charge over you. Lest you dash your foot against a stone. Satan, the devil, quotes the Psalms. Satan. The devil quotes the Bible. Satan, the liar, the accuser of the brethren, quotes the Bible. But because he's the devil, he misquotes it. It's right here in the text. He says, just, just throw yourself down from this temple. He, he give his angels charge over you. And he'll catch you before you dash your foot against the stone. But he left out the major portion of that passage. Because that passage in Psalm says, if you just cast yourself down, he will keep you in all your ways. Now the devil leaves that part out. He says he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now that's far different from what the devil said. The devil says throw yourself down and he'll send his angels to catch you. But the Bible says he will guard you, he will keep you so that you don't fall down against the stone. Somebody missed that. Satan is trying to get Jesus to do some acrobatic feat. He's trying to get Jesus to do some stunt so that uh, men will believe. But listen, the problem with, with, with Ringling Brothers kinds of worship services, the problem with a church becoming a show is that the show got to get bigger every week. Thank you for tuning in to A Call to Joy. It is our prayer that the Word of God has brought joy, strength, and faith to your life. We would love to have you as our guest at Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church, where we are exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinner. For your convenience, we have a 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. worship service every Sunday morning and 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. Lily Grove is located at 7034 Till Wester Street, Houston, Texas, 77021, or feel free to visit our website at www. At lilygrove.org. Until next week, God has called us to a life of joy.